Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode on season three of the Parts of the Pros podcast. For any new listeners just tuning in, uh, this is a podcast series where I sit down with some of the most talented and successful execs in sports and entertainment, learning about their journey so far, the path to success in sports business, as well as career related industry topics. I'm sat with David Burt today, a successful sales and strategy leader and executive, currently the EVP of sales and business development at the Pittsburgh Pirates. David, pleasure having you on the podcast today. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Excited to uh, excited to chat. Good stuff. Question I always kick these things off with. Um, it's a great starting point. Um, take us back to the early days, David. How, how did you first get into sports? How did you first break into the industry? That's a great question. So um, I was in college and I knew I wanted to get into sales. Uh, sales was something that my dad was in. Uh, I always felt like sales was, uh, you know, very competitive and you could always like the proof was in the pudding of, you know, the, the effort that you're putting in was tangible results. Um, and a friend of mine said, Hey, did you ever think about, uh, selling, selling tickets for a sports team? And to me, that meant like sitting in the box office window and, you know, taking people's orders uh, as they walk up to a game. And he said, now my buddy actually sells like season ticket plans and groups and sweet rentals uh, for the Dallas stars. And, you know, they're looking for somebody I can pass your name along to them and uh, started doing the research and had no idea that there were actually sales positions in with sports teams. So got super excited about that. Um, went down interviewed and and luckily was uh got the position as as a uh, entry level ticket sales rep and so my first job in sports was with the Dallas Stars selling uh selling tickets honestly the amount of people that I speak to that start their careers in ticket sales is is pretty insane it's almost but I think it makes a lot of sense because it's the starting point you have to work hard you have to grind you're learning from you know a lot of good commercial leaders around you the I like what you mentioned, by the way, about the idea of, you know, you work hard and you get what you get out of the work that you put in. Um, I think it's a really important component in sales. Would you say that I guess those kind of earlier um initial roles that you had in your in your sports career have kind of helped shape to get to where you've got to today? And we'll obviously dive into things in a little more detail in a moment, but just on that on that topic specifically, I think it's quite an interesting point of view. Yeah, no, I think. I think what it has allowed me to do is um, not ask people to do something that I haven't done myself or wouldn't be willing to do myself. Uh, and I think that's a pretty important aspect of leadership is just, you know, being able to say, hey, I've done this before or, hey, let's do this together. Right. Um, so I think, you know, coming up through the ticket sales world and being held accountable for driving revenue, even though it was on a smaller level of my personal accounts you know, thinking about how you manage your book of business and then, you know, expanding from there as you take on more roles. But um, I do, I do love, I don't, I don't, wouldn't change my career path uh, if I had a choice. Like I love to be in ticket sales. I think my favorite job in ticket sales, um, it was being an inside sales manager. And for me, that was because I got to, to teach people and it was people who were hungry coming into the industry um so you know yeah i wouldn't change it i wouldn't change it if i if i could that's for sure and this is with the new orleans hornets right uh yeah inside sales manager was with uh the new orleans hornets yes correct nice. how did you find that kind of first taste that first flavor of transitioning from you know an individual contributor to uh to leading the team i failed miserably at first to be honest i thought <laughs> the best people thought... usually do I thought everybody wanted to be managed like I wanted to be managed, which, you know, I grew up, you know, it's not, Hey, this is what you did. Right. It was, this is what you did wrong. And I, I never really wanted pats on the back or anything like that. And, um, you know, my first six months were, were difficult. You know, I did, my team didn't rally around me, um, because I was managing them how I wanted to be managed. And I only had one or two people that really appreciated being managed like that. And so I quickly learned and, and, um, my, my director really taught me like, Hey, you've got to start to understand what motivates people, what people are passionate about and, and really manage them differently. I think 
then what escalated from that was, you know, I was in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina happened and we moved our team to Oklahoma City. So now am I not only dealing with 10 different personalities, I'm also dealing with 10 people who are in completely different situations, you know, people who lost, you know, everything, uh, people who lost their cars, um, people who didn't have any family nearby to help them out, uh, anything like that. So um, really dealing with that on a different level, as well as really understanding that people are motivated differently, people um, are passionate about things different um, differently, and really understanding that you have to manage every single person, you know, with a unique playbook to help motivate them and drive them in their career even with that the, the hurricane and, and everything that kind of surrounded that i guess the idea of being a sales leader is usually people look at it and they say right they're leading a sales team they're responsible for that sales team's overall performance right so that's one way to look at it is that you're responsible for these people's performance from a sales perspective which is you know the majority of the job but <clears throat> Growing in that role, the more experience you get, the closer you build the relationships with these people. When these, you know, events happen in life, and some are great, some are, you know, not so great. In this instance, we're talking about the latter. How do you find, I guess, the, the kind of importance of the relationship that you have with that team really helps you to help them navigate through some of those more challenging situations? And it hasn't got to be that as an example, but as we're on the topic, I, I think it's a good perspective to share. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. I think you know, what was unique about that is we really rallied around each other more as like a family. Um, we knew when people were having hard, you know, hard days, difficult days, um, that we had to rally around them. I mean, people were dealing with trying to get FEMA checks, you know, trying to get back into New Orleans to get their stuff. Um, you know, people lost everything, just needed to buy clothes, a place to stay because, you know, their parents lived in, California and, you know, you couldn't drive from New Orleans, California. So I think we really rallied around each other more as like a family than more coworkers. Uh, and to this day, some of them are, are my best friends still. Um, you know, they were in my wedding. I was in their wedding. Um, you know, it, it was a unique, uh, unique experience in that line of uh, people like taking advantage of it. Like, oh, you know, we're close on a personal level. So I'm just going to kind of glide through this. I think because we created that bond, nobody wanted to let each other down and they really worked, worked hard um, to achieve what we were able to achieve in Oklahoma city, which was really cool. Yeah. Well, maybe you're obviously good at what you're doing from leading because the coyotes come knocking VP of ticket sales and service over there. How, how did that kind of come about? Talk us through that transition into a much more strategic leadership role. Yeah. So um, actually a guy I worked with in, in New Orleans um, was, was in Phoenix and he was leaving um, to join the NBA and he had recruited me out there and um, you know, I knew the Coyotes were going through some challenges. I didn't know that the owner was going to put them into bankruptcy and try to move them to, to Canada. Um, and so I think that in itself was an excellent challenge of like, um, you know, the NHL coming in, taking over the team, trying to sell it to new ownership groups. So we got to walk through like four or five ownership groups that came in, kicked the tires and thought differently about how to run the business. So, which then forced you to think differently about how you were going to run your business. So, you know, we took it, we took it as a positive of people might think, Hey, working in Phoenix for the coyotes during a bankruptcy and not knowing if you're going to be there the next year or anything else would have been like a very difficult situation. We, we looked at it as a positive of just nobody else is going to get this experience. And quite frankly, having to write four or five business plans in one year for four or five different people and getting, you know, feedback from four or five different people really pushed us to be innovative and, and think differently, especially, you know, when selling ice in the desert. Um, and, you know, I'm again, really proud of what we achieved there. And, and I think, again, going to these difficult situations 
for me personally, I thought was, was a challenge and something that was going to excel my career a lot quicker than, you know, going to work for a playoff team or a team that historically has been selling out. Yeah. Yeah. And I always think those, that when you take that step up into a more strategic, more senior role, it has to be something that's going to push you and challenge you. Right. I think it's very easy to go into something that, you know, you can do. And I I speak to so many people that I present opportunities to, and they say, Samir, honestly, I think I can do that with my eyes closed. It doesn't sound, you know, appealing enough to me. And mm-hmm. in one hand, I'm like, come on, you can do it with your eyes closed. Let's, let's go and do it with your eyes closed. And surely you're going to fly in this, in this role. But it makes a lot of sense. And I think that speaks volumes to the, you know, type of individual that you are when you're wanting to continuously push yourself, which I think is, is something that oftentimes people kind of overlook in their careers is, is what am I do- Does this opportunity and what I'm doing in this opportunity give me the ability to continue to grow and to continue to learn and to, to continue to push my own kind of boundaries of, of what I believe is, is achievable. So I think that's, that's yeah. a, a really good transition. Yeah. And it's, it's scary going into those situations, right? Where it's like, okay, I, I know this is going to be a challenge and I know, you know, for instance, coming to the Pirates, I had never been first chair on on the partnership side. And that's what I really thought um, was really super intriguing about this. But, um, you know, you have this sense of like, okay, did I challenge myself too much? <laughs> but um, you surround yourself by by smart people and, and build your leadership team that that rallies around you. And and, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a lot of fun of what we accomplished here. Yeah, for sure. There's one thing that I'm, I'm, we're going to talk about, uh, Cronky Sports, and your time there in a moment, because it's, it's a pretty decent portion of your career, David. Um, one of the things that, uh, honestly, I've, I've just kind of picked up on it now as we've been talking through things, it sounds like you've you moved a lot in the earlier kind of phase of your career. Now, naturally, opportunities are always broader. There's always more out there when you're open to move and when you're open to the idea of relocation. But Taking all that into account, we're talking, you know, Dallas, New Orleans, Charlotte, Phoenix, um, Denver, and obviously now uh, Pittsburgh. You know, that's a that's a lot of moving over the years. But at the same time, looking back, how important would you say that was to, you know, helping you and supporting you to get to the seat that you're sat in today versus being, uh, I guess, restricted from a geographical perspective on, on where you'd like to reside? Hey, look, I've, I've seen it been done successfully both ways. Um, I've seen people stay with Oregon. We have people here that have been uh, with the Pirates for 30 years. Wow. Um, you know, for me, it was always more of a open, open to move because I did it a lot when I was a kid. Um, so that didn't scare me. Um, but again, the opportunity, there were more opportunities if you're, if you're willing to relocate versus staying put. So um, that was just something I, I always challenged myself that, you know, I had no ties to New Orleans. I had no ties to Pittsburgh. I had no ties to Arizona. Um, I had no ties to Denver. It, it was really, you know, challenge yourself to, to get outside of your comfort zone and, and more importantly, you know, prove that what you're doing and the way you do things works. Um, and that will set you up later on in your career to be a little bit more picky or, you know, say, Hey, you know what? I, w- I will take that job. That's a lot easier because, you know, now spending time with uh, family is, is a lot more important or something like that. So for me, it was always, it was always the opportunity of being able to relocate that, that I think afforded me more opportunities than if I was kind of restricting myself to a certain area. Yeah. You then transitioned over to, you know, just piggybacking off of the, the, the Phoenix move, the Coyotes, um transitioned across the Cronky. First, I guess C-suite level role, first real uh opportunity to go into an environment where I guess was a little different than than what you were used to, right? You you're used to working in one team in, in one format and one process, one, you know, form of branding, so to speak. Going from that to an organization that manages multiple assets, multiple teams, how did you kind of find that transition? Just talk to us about, you know, some of the things that worked really well from what you picked up in the past, but also some of the, you know, initial challenges that you kind of faced. Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, when I joined Kroenke, I never even thought that there would be zero off season because one of our teams was always in season the entire year. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot of advantages of owning a multi-property team and working for a multi-property team of, 
you know, your resources are much, much higher. Um, you can share best practices. So, uh, you know, you think about the NBA who does team bow really well and shares best practices really well. Um, but it's all teams outside your market. Well, now if you have four people sitting around the table, all dealing with the similar, you know, a similar market, um, being to brainstorm and, and bounce ideas off each other was fantastic. So we had a vice president of ticket sales over each team. Um, you know, each team had different challenges, obviously, um, but they were able to really um, bounce things off each other, brainstorm with each other, um, think of ideas with each other. And then also when you think about career advancement, if, you know, the avalanche didn't have a position open, but the nuggets did, it's a very easy transition. There's not a huge learning curve about the organization and some of the, you know, you think about joining a new organization. It's like, well, holy crap, where do I go to lunch? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. you're in a new city. Where do I go to lunch? Where do I, now you can advance your career, you know, in four different leagues and, and stay with the same organization. I think also it, it allowed us to use a lot of shared services. So in, in setting up the business intelligence team, you know, how do we, how do we centralize that BI team to, to really service the four teams, uh, the four teams, the two arenas, um, the, uh, the uh, television network, all of that stuff. We could really centralize that and really use our resources efficiently versus having to build, you know, four separate teams or six separate teams, whatever, however that might, you might look at that. So um, I think, you know, selling sports and entertainment is pretty, transitional you can transition in it through uh through every league i think just kind of the the mentality of of what it takes to sell a partnership or what it takes to sell a ticket is pretty much the same it's just different strategies um you know baseball for instance you have 10 games in a row where you know you're building 10 group sales strategies for <laughs> literally 10 days straight right. versus major league soccer, where you have one game every two weeks, you know? So it also allows you to forget wins and losses pretty quickly. Cause you have a game the next day where, you know, major league soccer, you, you might have a bad game and you don't have a chance to rebound at home for another, another two weeks. So um, there's definitely advantages of working for a multi-entity team. And there's, you know, advantages of working for a single single market or a, a single team in, in your market. So um, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. I think they're, they're very different. And also your focus, your, well, at least at Crocky, my focus was, um, was very vertical where it's, you know, it's very specific on ticketing and premium and suites and BI um, for the four teams uh, where if you become, you know, over here, I oversee all revenues. So it's a lot more, it's a lot more horizontal and in, in the areas that I'm overseeing. So um, there's a lot of advantages and disadvantage of, of doing single property or multi-property. And one of the things just going into your current role now, the Pirates, one of the things that you and I have already spoken about that, you know, I've, I've, I've also spoken to other people about is, your guys' utilization of not just technology, but, but AI specifically um, to improve business efficiencies, to help make better decisions. Um, there are tons of different benefits to using AI, I guess. For today's you know, main topic of conversation, I think a lot of people can really benefit from. I would love to just you know, pick your brain around a few different areas of, of the way that AI is, is currently being utilized in the industry and uh, the benefits, some of the challenges that we're going to be facing uh, as an industry as a whole. Um, to kick that part off, David, would you, you know, be kind enough to give us a, a general overview as to how AI is currently being utilized in the industry and um, what you guys are doing at the Pirates, I guess, that's helping you to, to stay competitive, to, to provide, in some instances, an advantage against some of your competitors? Yeah, I mean, AI is getting is getting huge. It's 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 building content. Now it's, it's engaging with your consumers. Um, you know, for us specifically, especially on the, on the B2C strategy. So directly the business to consumer strategy, you know, we look at it as inbound. So people who are coming to <clears throat> coming to the website, looking for information, we're having AI engage with those people. 
and then our outreach, uh, you know, gone are the glory days of making a hundred phone calls and 75 people answering the phone. You know, you'd be lucky to make 500 calls in a week and 10 people answer the phone now. So we're using AI for all of our outreach. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but we've taken all cold calling away from sales reps. So, you know, we're not, we're not saying, Hey, here's a, a list of people who bought a single game in 2023, call them and try and engage with them. We're actually having the AI warm those leads up. Um, and what we're finding is that through the reps outreach and through the AI outreach, um, consumers are engaging at an average of about 4.2 contacts. <clears throat> if you think about a rep reaching out to their, their database or their, their pipeline, you know, they're usually hitting somebody once every 30 days. So you think, okay, that means that that account is not engaging with you for at least a month. The AI is engaging at least seven times in two weeks. Wow. So that outreach and that engagement and self-identification of, yes, I'm interested, not, no, I'm not interested is significantly being um, cut off. So um, we are getting people to engage with us and tell us if they're interested a lot quicker, which is allowing people to move through the sales process a lot quicker. And also is allowing our, our reps to focus on people who want to be focused on, right? I don't want to keep calling you over and over if you're not interested and in wasting time on that. Also, what we're trying to focus on with AI is, is the, um, the e-commerce strategy. <clears throat> so I, I feel like I feel like sports teams make it really difficult to take people's money, right? Like you go, you go on a website, you're like, uh, you know what? I'm interested in the suite. Take a look at the suite options. Then it's, hey, fill out this form and, and somebody will call you. If I want to buy, um, you know, I went online and, and bought a tooth, toothbrush head replacements for my Sonicare today on Amazon. It was literally like toothbrush place, uh, tooth, <laughs> toothbrush head replacement, Sonicare, found it, click to buy, and I'm and I've given my money away. So I think tomorrow in your in your mail. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's and it's here tomorrow. I mean, you can buy a Tesla online now. Uh, I think what we do, we we haven't done a very good job of of making it easy for consumers to engage with us without having to actually talk with a person and buy exactly what they want. So that's a big focus of, of ours as well, is that we're trying to automate um not only through the outreach, but then how do we extend the sales process through AI? Um, what we're seeing is a lot of these small level accounts. So people who buy six games or a 20, 20 person um, group can literally go through the sales process automated without having to talk to somebody. So how do we take those accounts off the sales reps plates and allow them to focus on bigger fish, which is obviously making them more efficient is making them drive more revenue and is really not bogging them down with somebody who is like, well, do I want the Yankees game or the Mets game, or let me call my friend, you know, it's really automating that process so they don't have to deal with that. So, you know, AI, AI is something that's incredible. I think, uh, you know, it was definitely something scary when you started to think about it. Um, we've gone all in on it. I think, um, the way we rolled it out to the reps as well was was very important that we got them involved in the process early. So it wasn't like, hey, we're just introducing this technology to you and changing the entire way you do things to, to get internal buy-in. Um, and we've seen a ton of success with it. Um, again, it's, it's cut our conversion rates down. It's uh, decreased the, the, um, the time it, it's taken for clients to engage with us. Um, and it's really, really made us a lot more efficient. There's, there's a lot of really good points that you touch on there. Um, one of the things that just kind of set, stand out to me in everything that you were saying, I think AI equals efficiency is probably the most simplest way that you can put it, if utilizing the right way, of course. Think back to when you know you're in a, a ticket sales rep and account exec in your early days, and I can you imagine you land there, black book of contacts. Um, here, David, here's your pipeline. Here's your you know um, contacts that we want you to reach out to over the course of the next few months. Make some sales. Get on with it. To now, sales reps can come in, have a very 
advanced uh, technological platform that takes away the idea of just calling endlessly, hoping someone answers, um, hoping that they're willing to buy it, hoping that they will call you back. Um, when you think about efficiency in that, in that, and I can imagine you've probably thought about this yourself, how beneficial this might have been for me when I was being a ticket sales rep. So I think the underlying part in all of that is it's made the ability to do, you know, your jobs as, as ticket salespeople or as salespeople in general, or as business execs in general, a lot easier. Yeah, I, I would say it makes it a lot different. So, you know, we're, we're still needing to train you on a sales process. Sales process is just different now, right? right? You're not, you're not needing to, um, you know, train on breakup calls <laughs> or things like that. You know, you're more training on, okay, this person is engaged. How do you not, how do you not lose them from being, how do you make sure they don't disengage? Yeah. Um, how are you making sure that you're maintaining a healthy pipeline? And what I mean by that is, is if somebody raises their hand and self identifies as, Hey, I'm engaged and I'm interested in something. How do we make sure you're getting in touch with them within 24 hours? Cause the longer and longer we wait, the least likely they are to buy. And then the follow-up process, right? If you have too many people in your pipeline, um, and you're not continuing to follow up with them after they, after they've engaged with the AI, we've seen that after it gets about four days, the, the percentage to close drops drastically. Yeah. So how are we making sure that we're getting people in and out of your pipeline so that you're able to maintain, you know, that rate of engagement to, to ensure that you have the best probability to close, to close the lead. So it's kind of, it's fascinating. Again, like you, you hit the nail on the head. If I had this technology when I was a rep, it'd be so much more fun and so much more enjoyable rather than, you know, calling and getting yelled at or, or getting hung up on all the time. Um, but it's just made the sales process different and, and the way that we have to teach and train different. Um, but yeah, I think the the whole idea of not having to make a hundred phone calls every day is is in my mind fantastic, and I know our reps enjoy not having to do that as well. Like we've stopped tracking, you know, what is typically called the hustle metrics of how much how many calls did you make, how much talk time. Like none of that really matters at the end of the day. If you're not driving revenue, just because you made a ton of calls, like you're not, you're not getting the job done. So, you know, we stopped paying attention to those hustle metrics and it's really healthy pipeline. And at the end of the day, driving revenue. Yeah. There's, um, you guys are clearly using AI <clears throat> in various different ways to, to, to benefit the business, to drive the business forward. But I can imagine there are probably a lot of people that are sat there right now thinking, this is great. This all sounds really beneficial. Where the hell do I even start? <laughs> so how did this initial kind of idea, I guess, come about within the Pirates organization of, hey, look, there's this AI tool that's popping up left, right and center at the minute. It's all over social media. There are images that can be created within seconds of an idea popping into someone's head. Uh, there are videos, there are music videos that are now being created. There's this idea of actors maybe out of a job in the next 10 years because AI can generate movies. But I think very simply, where, where do people even start? Because there's so much noise around it that it's almost difficult to, to know where to begin. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we started <clears throat> we started using the tool about two years ago. And I think like most teams, we were saying, okay, let's give the leads that are least likely to sell to AI and see if we can just, you know, get some random people to buy. And our business intelligence team kind of took a different look at it um, and said, well, why don't we give the AI the best leads and get that, get those people to engage versus having the reps continuously call them and bother them and everything else. And so, you know, we started testing that last year of, all right, let's, let's create these evergreen campaigns or let's take, <clears throat> you know, group renewals or some flex plan renewals and run that through the AI and see how successful we are. And when we saw the metrics and the amount of time it took uh, for people to engage with us and how much more, um, how much easier the conversations were for the reps, we were like, okay, we've been doing, we've been thinking about this all wrong. 
of, you know, let's, let's use the AI to try and dig up leads where now it's like, we have the good leads. Let's get the AI to sell them and get them in and out of the, the sales process more, more efficiently and a lot quicker. Um, and again, as we started looking into the data and tracking everything, you know, we, we went to our team president and our owner and said, Hey, this might sound crazy, but this is our plan. We want to, you know, cut all, all cold outreach away from the reps, have it generate through, uh, have it be generated through AI. And this is, these are the metrics behind it and why we think, why we think it'll be more successful. And the question wasn't, the question wasn't like, you know, why do you want to do this? It was more like, are there any other tools out there that are going to allow us to be more efficient and, and allow us to sell people a lot quicker, which is allow, which now has pushed us to, you know, work with third parties to make sweet buying a lot easier, um, group sales process all online. So again, going back to that e-commerce strategy of how do we get people to engage with us, but now engage with our technology and go through that entire sales process automated and not have to worry about bogging people down uh, in the office and let them focus on bigger, bigger and better things. So it sounds like you, you've done a great job at ensuring that this is making the lives of your employees, your sales staff, um, <clears throat> different to your point, but, but easier, more efficient, right? You touched on one point around fan engagement and, you know, the idea of wanting to purchase a suite and the process and the difficulty that, that some people face in, in, in doing so. If I'm, you know, a Pirates fan right now, I'm a sports fan right now, and I'm thinking, what other ways can AI be used to really enhance the fan engagement, my engagement, and the overall kind of fan experience, uh, whether that be at games, whether that be uh, you're online, you're looking to, to purchase merchandise. There are obviously a bunch of different um channels that we can we can go down here but thinking and speaking about it more generally what are some of the things that you guys are thinking about and, and working on at the moment from a an overall fan experience and engagement perspective yeah so that's a great question we talked about that and and really specific to pittsburgh and the market in pittsburgh like if you look at um you know cable is still strong here in pittsburgh like not a lot of not a lot of cord cutters um you know, people are still reading the newspaper. So do we really want to dive into like augmented reality? I don't think that's something that we want to dive into right now. You know, maybe if I'm working for the San Francisco Giants and it's a, you know, a tech savvy marketplace, yes. Um, for us, it's about how do we make, how do we make the important stuff a lot easier? And what I mean by that is how do we make parking easier? How do we make getting into the stadium easier? How do we make getting a beer easier? How do we make engaging with the scoreboard a lot easier? So, um, you know, we did, we did introduce some AI technology where you, you take a selfie, you send it to the scoreboard and the scoreboard actually makes you a pirate. It's kind of, it's kind of funny, but, um, but we're more focusing on how do we, how do we take the things that are important, um, to, to our consumers? And we, and we know that by doing NPS. So net promoter score, we survey our, our single game buyers and our group buyers after every game, what went well, what didn't go well, what can we improve on? You know, two years ago, we identified wait times and concessions um, with the speed of baseball changing drastically. If you were getting up and going to get concessions or a beer and it took 15 minutes, you're now potentially missing two innings where previously you were missing maybe half an inning. Um, so that became a big focus of our enhancements of the building is how do we make the concessions experience a lot quicker and a lot easier, whether that be through mass gins or, you know, brew throughs or marketplaces. And we've seen that be successful. Um, how do we identify like if there is, um, an issue in one of the restrooms, like, is it not clean? Is it out of toilet paper? Is it out of, um, you know, soap, you know, how can we, make sure that you're engaging with the ballpark app and the AI is reading that and distributing that to the, to the correct people. So I think for us, the focus is going to be on what are the things that are important to the, to our fans and how do we make their experience at the ballpark a lot better by introducing AI to help enhance that. That's great. So lots of things to think about, of course, um, the whole idea of 
ensuring that you're using and and taking into account what your fans are saying in the local market, I think is a really important one because you're right, you're going to be looking at very different initiatives to what maybe the Mets or Yankees fans will be um, will be thinking about uh, and some of the uh, efficiencies that they'd like to see introduced uh, when they're at the uh, when they're at the ballpark. When it comes to data analytics and the idea of AI improving and influencing some of those kind of real big decision-making processes, whether it's within the leadership team, whether it's within your direct team, how are you kind of seeing that transition? And have you guys been been thinking about the utilization of AI when it comes to some of the broader, bigger business decision-making factors, or is that still something that's kind of yet to be seen? We're not there yet. I think, I think we want to be there. I think, um, you know, we, um, when I got here in, in, in the beginning of 21, um, our business intelligence team was one. Um, it's now nine. Um, I think, I think, you know, our owner and our president has really pushed us to start making data driven decisions, um, which has allowed us to be a lot more, um, strategic on how we're pricing things, um, how we're scaling the building, how we're staffing for a game, you know, projecting attendance correctly, all that type of stuff. I think we want to get to a, to a place where, you know, you can literally touch a button and it helps you make, make a, a strategic decision. Um, we're not there yet. Um, you know, I think, I think we've taken a giant leap in, in just the way we're, we're handling things on the B2C side where we haven't seen as much success as on the B2B side and, and where we still think it's important to have that, um, that outreach, uh, that one-to-one -one outreach from a person, um, you know, setting appointments, getting face-to-face -face appointments, doing discovery meetings. We're still seeing that being really important on the B2B side, um, but we are constantly pushing ourselves to take those you know the emails that everybody gets every day of like hey i've got this new technology you know i'd love to i'd love to pilot with you we're now pushing ourselves to try and take those meetings as much as we can because we know that we want to be innovative and we and we want to be kind of the first first to market especially you know how competitive pittsburgh is in in the sports in the sports landscape um, so we want to try and be in it as an innovative and, and ahead of the curve as possible. And it sounds like you guys are already doing so much with, with, with AI at the moment, of course. It seems to be one of those things. I mean, technology is advancing and, and developing unprecedentedly. And every other week, there's something new going on. Uh, there's a new technology platform. There's a new software. There's a new this. There's a new that. Where do you see... AI specifically um, in the future of, of sports and how do you kind of see the uh, involvement uh, of, uh, of AI specifically, whether that be for the pirates, whether that be for the industry uh, as a whole? No, I think, look, if the tool can help us be efficient, right? Like, I think that's, that's the most important is, is, is you, you hit the nail on the head with AI uh, creating efficiencies. I think, I think that's most important as you as you think about, you know, when should we cool the building? When should we heat the building? Um, you know, when should we when should we winterize the building? Like if if, if AI can help us with that, um, I think sports gambling is an interesting uh, an interesting area with AI. Is like, you know, are, is it able to set lines better? Is it able to predict um, outcomes a lot easier? Um, and then again, for for us specifically, it's you know, we don't want to introduce too much technology that distracts fans from the game because what we're getting a sense that people want to come see a baseball game outside because they want to be outside. They don't want to be in front of their phone, um, but they want to make sure that they have cell service. They want to make sure that they can, you know, order something from their seat and pick it up efficiently. Um, so, I think the landscape is crazy. And as you mentioned, the technologies are getting more and more advanced. Um, it's more taking a step back and ensuring that what you're doing on the tech and AI side is appropriate for your marketplace. Cause every, every market is different. Right. And, you know, for us to introduce some, some crazy technologies in, in Pittsburgh might not make sense 
Um, and, or it might, you know, I think it's, it's really truly understanding your fan base. We're seeing a younger fan base coming to the stadium these past couple of years. And I think that that's because of the rule changes. Uh, I think it's because of sports gambling and, and being legal in Pennsylvania. And I think, you know, people like we call them starlights want to be seen at the game. And we've created these kind of communal areas where it's, you can go, you can hang out at a bar, you can talk to your friends and, and the game is more in the background versus being uh, front and center. Um, so it'll be interesting. It'll, it'll be interesting, interesting to see how tech and AI is driving, how you set up your stadium, how you set up your capacities, um, you know, and, and really what your focus is on, on the fan experience. That's really interesting to me. The idea and I, I applaud you for thinking about it because it's, it's never a thought that's coming to my mind. But the idea of the younger fan base going to the ballpark, going to the stadium and preferring a community of like-minded individuals around them. And that's what the enjoyment that they get out of going to the stadium and having various technology platforms around them, whether it be screens showing the game, whether it be stats on, on, on another screen, whether it be, you know, um, in the UK, you have uh, live uh, better knots uh, that show up on the screens as well. So, you know, as, as the US um, adapts more to the world of, of gambling, it'll be interesting to see that starting to come into play. But that, it just seems crazy to me because for me, if I'm going to a stadium to watch a game, I'm there to watch the game, right? And yes, to your point, I want phone signal. I want to be able to text my buddies and say, hey, did you see that goal? Did you see that play? Um, but the idea of, of thinking about that, you know, the next generation of fans, um, I think changing the rules of the game has certainly helped to introduce a younger fan base in, the, uh, in, in MLB specifically. But when you think about, you know, the next five, 10 years, I think you're just spot on. There are going to be people that are going to want to go to a game just for the idea of the community around them, just for the idea of being involved in the sport, but not so much so that they're strapped to the seat and the only idea of them consuming that sport is is sat and watching it. Like as we as we know, is very standard across the industry. But the idea of of evolution when it comes to how fans consume uh, sports and consume their favorite teams playing. Is, is certainly uh, something to think about. Yeah, no, I, and that's the way our, our marketing team is looking at things is, is you, we're not saying every there's only one segment of, of pirate spires. We're saying there's actually five um, and they all behave differently. They, their buying patterns are differently, are different. Um, what they want to come to the stadium and enjoy is different. Um, so how, how can you, in a very limited space, create five different experiences for five different people, you know, five different types of people. So yeah. that's where we're trying to be super creative and, and think about, okay, how do we make communal areas? How do we make sure that the, the scoreboard is showing exit velocity and type of pitch and speed of pitch for those that are super dialed in onto the stats? <clears throat> you know, how are we making sure that we're showing out of town scores um, efficiently because people are, are baseball fans. How do we make it family friendly so that, you know, when a kid loses, a young kid loses interest in an inning, you're not just having to leave the game. You know, do you, do you, are you creating areas for, for younger families that can still in, engage with the ballpark? So we're trying to think of that of like, how do we create a community uh, in the ballpark for five different communities uh, yeah. and, and, allow, and and really, really expand your net of people you're trying to a, attract to the stadium. Yeah. Community diversity, I guess, is, is maybe a phrase we'll start to hear a lot more of in the, uh, in the industry. Actually, like I'm, I'm going to steal that. I'm going to pretend <laughs> I came up with it. <laughs> Good stuff. It's yours, coin it. Um, last thing for you, David, uh, any advice that you'd give to any other um, sports execs, any other people that are listening to, to this today uh, that are looking to integrate AI into their businesses, into their operations? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, from the AI perspective, like, don't let it scare you. It It, it is scary to think about and, and to think about changing what, you know, we've been taught for so many years of how we're handling outreach and how we're selling tickets and selling consumers. 
and it's just not the way consumers are behaving uh, in in 2024, and and not to be not to be scared of it. Um, you know, technology is is a powerful thing, and and can be if used correctly, can be can be great for your business, and not only great for your business, but also great for your consumers. So, you know, don't be hesitant to to dive right in and and really get after it. Love it, love it, man. Speaking from experience. David, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. Uh, I think there's a lot that people can take from this. Uh, I've certainly taken some some uh, interesting uh, thoughts away that I'm going to run up the mill internally here with uh, with our founders. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it yourself. I hope the listeners have enjoyed it. Uh, thank you and, and good luck uh, to the Pirates in the rest of the season. There's some exciting things on the horizon, I'm sure. I hope so. I hope so. I really appreciate it and really appreciate you having me on. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll be back next week for another episode.